Good morning, good morning. Welcome to New Mercies. How cool is that, seeing a few kids again? Got one down here and got a couple coming in the back. All exciting. Happy Father's Day to everybody. And have, thank you, and happy Father's Day to our Lord and Savior. We, uh, we should take a service to the Lord in prayer this morning, shall we? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for all the things that we get from you as our Father. We thank you for the blessings. We thank you for all the glory, the things that we don't even realize we get. We just pray now for new mercies as we come together this morning to worship you, and we ask that Pastor's word would hit our hearts and that we'd carry that word with us this week. We just pray for your guidance and blessing and direction. In Jesus' name, amen.
Yes, our God is an awesome God. There is thunder in his footsteps and lightning in his fist. Our God is an awesome God. The Lord wasn't joking when he kicked him out of Eden. It wasn't for no reason that he shed his blood. He was hurt very close, so you better be believing that our God is an awesome God. In the void of the night, our God was an awesome God. He spoke into the darkness and created the light. Our God is an awesome God. The judgment and wrath that he put out on Sodom, mercy and grace he gave us at the cross. I hope that we have not too quickly forgotten that our God is an awesome God. God, he reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God, our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. Father, we thank you for the love that we have for one another because you first loved us and taught us how to love. We thank you for this congregation, for the, the love that we share with one another, the opportunities that we have to come together to worship you, to look to your word. And we pray that you would bless us in this service now as we look to your word and that you would challenge us by that word. We thank you for fathers and that on this Father's Day that we have the opportunity to, to reflect a little bit on what it is to be a father and the responsibilities that that bring. Just bless us in this service now, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> This morning is Father's Day and I want to talk a little bit about the difference between success and significance. Success is accomplishing any task that you want. It might be uh, bodybuilding, it might be a career, it might be making money. Uh, anything that you achieve uh, can bring you success. You can succeed in whatever it is that you want to do. Uh, but. Um, Significance is a little bit more than just success because significance is not just accomplishing a task, but it's accomplishing a task that makes a difference. Uh, a lot of things people do, uh, they succeed, but how much does it really matter? A man by the name of Francis <clears throat> Johnson in 1950 started a project. He worked four hours a day for 29 years to accomplish a task, and he accomplished that task. He built the largest ball of string in the world. And you might think, well, that's quite an accomplishment, but does it really change anything in the world? In the town of Darrow, Minnesota, where he lives, on the, the second Saturday in August, they have String Day. And, uh, the, you know, Burton has the fair, Chardon has the Maple Festival, well, Darrow, Minnesota has String Day. But does it really matter? I mean, I couldn't believe four hours a day, and that uh, ball of string is uh, 12 feet in diameter, weighs 17,400 pounds. And so that's quite an accomplishment. He was successful in what he did. But does it really matter? Think about the things in your life that you do, and you succeed in doing them, but are they significant? Do they really make a difference in the lives of people? I think as we think of fathers and honoring fathers on Father's Day, being a father, you don't just accomplish a task, but you do something that is significant, something that has lasting 
effect and lasting results. You know, in my own life, much of who I am is because of who my father was. Uh, and, you know, my father, a few of you know, Dorothy and Ethel, I think, uh, know, knew my father. He died in 1987, so that's been quite a while ago. But, uh, you know, there were certain characteristics of my father, and my sister wrote a poem for his funeral. And, you know, as I look back over my father, you know, he always wore red ties. He was an engineer. Uh, he could fix anything. And, you know, my sister wrote this, so please bear with me as I, as I read this. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul said to Peter, who in heaven happened by, Hey, Peter, who's that new guy, the one wearing the bright red tie? I saw him late on Monday night when through the pearly gate he peeked. He had an oil can in his hand and he fixed that pesky squeak. I know the man you're speaking of. He was studying the golden seal. Then he crawled under the golden chariot and tightened that wobbly wheel. I sat near him last, in last night's service. He sang a little off key. During the message, his head was nodding. He looked sound asleep to me. But later that evening, back by the lake, near the tree with a fallen limb, he sat in rapt attention as the father talked with him. The master builder shared the secrets of all that was made by his hand. In voices low, they talked on and on of that marvelous master plan. The man seemed so excited to learn how gravity came to be and to hear the whys of the laws of physics and touch the source of all energy. Then God reminded the man that the purpose of the wonders he had sent from above was to give to all his children an expression of his love. The man who sat with the Savior looked up with his clear blue eyes and smiled in understanding at the God all-knowing and wise. Now heaven will probably squeak less and engines won't sputter and groan and hydraulic pumps are being installed for Jack Williams has come home. You know, that doesn't mean much to you, but it means so much to me because he had blue eyes and, you know, all the things that my sister talked about remind me of what it was to grow up with Jack as my father and Hazel as my mother. And I, I look back at, with, at my youth because I know they cared for us. You know, they cared, they sacrificed so we could go to college. They did so much because of their love for us. Significance is making a difference in a person's life. And I'm thankful that, that I had the father that I did. I, I had a grandfather that I loved too. I won't go into too much. He's the one that taught me to fish and instilled in me the love for fishing. Uh, and he uh, it was during the depression, he went to, to get a job and they asked, what would you like to teach? He didn't know he was signing up to be a teacher. He said, well, I could teach shop. He had no college education, but he started teaching shop and then went to night school. And after my father had graduated, my grandfather graduated. And so we learned the importance of education and working hard to accomplish the goals. Linda's father, who died uh, way too young, uh, also was a, a man. I remember, you know, he was just a fun person to be around. He had a, a a, a unique sense of humor. He loved to play baseball and hit the ball and run around the bases, and he was a man of faith. And these are the things that shaped her life and my life. And that's what a father is, a person that shapes someone's life. Now we understand today that a lot of people don't have fathers. There's no father in the home. So how can those young people succeed in life when they don't have the role model. And it's just another example of how when, when we get out away from God and away from his plan, life becomes much more difficult for us. And what we want is to have a good life and we want to carry that life on for others. We want to have a positive influence in the lives of the people that are around us. Maybe we don't shape the whole culture but we can shape the lives of those that are around us. Or maybe as Christians, we can shape the culture. I tried to think of a politician that was positive influence in shaping our culture, and I couldn't. 
So we'll have skipped the politicians, but you know, the person I think that shaped our culture more than anyone else is Billy Graham. Because he was, preached the gospel, but he also was accepted by so many people. The goodness of his life made him accepted by almost everyone. Some people didn't like him, but uh, almost universally accepted. And it's interesting that his son who is trying to carry on the ministry is not universally accepted. But I think that speaks more of the change in the culture than it does in the change of the, the Billy Graham heritage and family. So we're getting away from things. We, there are people that can shape the culture. I think Martin Luther King <clears throat> shaped the culture in many ways. I grew up in a very white area. We had one black family in the high school that I went to. And that black uh, boy, Grady Pettigrew, was elected class president. <clears throat> there was no racial prejudice. And, you know, <clears throat> I wasn't aware, <clears throat> I wasn't aware that much <clears throat> about the civil rights movement and why, <clears throat> why things were happening that were happening. But it's because I didn't grow up in the South and things were very different there. But I think Martin Luther King was a man that tried through peaceful means to bring about change. And some of the greatest speeches that have ever been written were written by him. His I Have a Dream speech, you know, if we look at it and we understand it in the context of those times, and those times are still true today, there, there was a a need, and he talked about, you know, not being judged by the color of your skin, but the content, uh, content of your character. Didn't excuse things, but wanted everyone to be better and to bring people together. So we can make a difference in our local family settings and even through the culture if we stand and come to be who God calls us to be. The passage of scripture that I'd like for us to, to consider today comes from the Sermon on the Mount. It talks about, Jesus talks about the, the birds of the air that don't toil or spin yet, uh, or, uh, and the, the lilies of the field that don't toil or spin, but God cares for them. And then he goes on to say, so do not worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear for the pagans run after these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you as well. So what I'd like, if we want to be people of significance in the culture today, we need to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things that we're looking for that are a part of this life will be added to us as well. For an understanding of God, understanding of His righteousness is a foundation upon which we can build a life that will be successful, not just in our religious areas, but there, our life isn't divided into different areas. But the religious foundation is the foundation for everything that we do and everything that we have. So are we seeking first the kingdom of God? Is He the foundation? of your life because the foundation, everything is built upon the foundation and the foundation isn't right, then the life will not be successful. So what is the foundation of your life? What is the foundation of your life? I hope it's knowing God, knowing his word, seeking first his kingdom, his righteousness, and then allowing him <clears throat> to add all these other things to us as well. From the message, most of the scriptures I use are from the NIV, but this is, this is the, the definition. You probably remember Hebrews 11.1, 1, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Uh, the, the message is a paraphrase which kind of amplifies, but I would like to read that definition <clears throat> from the message. He says, the fundamental fact of existence is that this trust in God 
This faith is the firm foundation under everything that makes life worth living. It's our handle on what we can't see. We just read part of that again. It's the, our faith is the firm foundation under everything that makes life worth living. So our faith in God gives us the foundation for everything else that matters in life. Do you wanna have a family where there's love? Faith and understanding of God in the creation is God is our heavenly father. A trust that God is, his will is the best will for us. That's a foundation for our life. You wanna be in business? The attitudes and characteristics that God gives us are the foundation for a successful business. You know, be humble, care about other people. In every aspect of life, our faith in God and the understanding that he gives us to the meaning and purpose of life is the foundation of everything that makes life meaningful <clears throat> and worthwhile. In a family, you want to provide, one of the main things I think for a family to provide for their children is security, a safe place to be a safe place where you can go out into the world and you can get beat up. But the family is where you come home and it can be a safe place. When it comes to safety and security, sometimes maybe the first thing we think of, well, you have to, to make enough money, you know, to provide for a living. And so we focus a little bit more on that than, uh, than we could focus on other things. But the greatest security that we need to have is a loving home where the parents love each other, care for each other, they love their children, and they teach the, those, those basic important truths that God has for us, that it's a safe place. Movie, The Prince of Tides, I saw this movie a long time ago. It's uh, Nick Nolte and uh, Barbara Streisand were the two stars of the movie. And I remember one of the early lines in that movie, it was about a very dysfunctional family. And in looking up a little bit about it to find this exact quote, I found out that the author of The Prince of Tides came from a very dysfunctional family and several of his movies were just really caricatures of his own life. But this is the quote. He says, I don't know when my parents began their war with each other, but I do know that the only prisoners they took were their children. You know, we think, well, you know, in a relationship, it's just about us, but our children are affected by everything that we do. So going back again, I, I would say to you, so many children in the inner city or in other places, you know, have no idea of what it would be to be a family because they've never seen it. And how can you do something that you've never seen or don't know? And so the, the security that we need to provide is an emotional security. And again, what is the foundation of the family? It's love, it's God's example to us. Husbands love their wives, wives love their husbands, and you love your children. You don't provoke your children under wrath. All the things that the Bible teaches are the foundation of what can make a family that can work. So the foundation of the family needs to be more than just providing for the physical needs of the children, but providing for the other needs as well. And we know the Bible says that God is love, and so the most important thing that we can do in the family is love. You know, the great, only two commandments, love God, love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, everything else is, is summed up in that. But what does it mean to love? You know, we think of an emotion, oh, I love them, you know, how you feel, uh, you know, when you're in that person's presence. But how does the Bible define love? Love is patient, it's kind. You know, are you kind in everything you do? Love is patient, love is kind, doesn't envy, doesn't boast, not proud, not rude, not self-seeking, not easily angered, keeps no record of wrongs, doesn't delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. That's what love is. It's not just the emotion that we have. But 
In a lot of ways, our country does not honor love anymore because it's all about power. It's all about forcing your will on somebody else. And that's the opposite of what love is. Love is sometimes considered weakness. You know, you don't pay back people that hurt you. Somebody hurts you, pay them back. You know, that's, that's our culture today. But the Bible says don't render evil for evil, but overcome evil with good. We don't demand our rights. We don't defend our turf, our position. How dare you challenge me? You know, the Bible says, come now and let us reason together. Let us try to solve the problems. So the world's all about accomplishment, achievement. It's all about appearance. But the Bible says it's to be all about love. Galatians 5, 6 says, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Talks of earlier been talking about, you know, the Jews were circumcised, this and that, you know, all the, the rituals and stuff that you've been through. And Paul writes, you know, in Galatians, the only thing that really matters is faith expressing itself through love. Wouldn't, it, wouldn't that be good? You know, he, he talked about the, the kind of things that, you know, the, the, the Jews had to go through. Uh, don't misunderstand me when I say this. But when you stand before God, God's not going to ask you how much money you made. But he's also not going to ask you how many scriptures you memorized, how many times you went to church. He's going to ask, did you love? Going to church is important because that's where you learn to love. But just going to church isn't what you need to do. You need to go to church and learn. Scripture is important. It's a lamp under our feet, a light under our path. But just knowing Scripture doesn't do you any good if you don't do what it says. So a lot of things that... Uh, I love kids. <laughs> so, you know, what a what a blessing to know that, you know, children are our heritage from the Lord. I know when our son was when we first found out that our son was uh, going to be born, that Linda was pregnant with him. Uh, that Sunday, and I didn't look it up, but uh, children are like arrows in a quiver. May your quiver be full. I mean, <laughs> and I, I used that to announce uh, when, when Jeffrey was going to be born. But God, as the foundation of our life, will lead to a significant life. Um, the Living Bible in Luke 9, 48 says, anyone who cares for a little child is caring for me. Caring for others is the measure of your greatness. So the measure of greatness is not the standards of the world, but the measure of greatness is God in our life affecting a change that causes us to look not just to ourselves but look to others. So much that we need to do, and we come together as Christians to encourage each other. We are better together. You know, we as associating with Christian people is what makes us stronger. Because the world doesn't see the world the way we do. And so if we're out in the world and we're not associating with Christian people, our values will be diluted by the influence of the people that are around us. So we need to draw together so they don't overpower us. But I wanna also make it clear, it doesn't mean we, we uh, you know, buy a thousand acres and all go live there, you know, and isolate ourselves from the world because the Bible also says we're to be salt and light in the world. We are to affect a change for good in the world that we live in. 
Um, I knew someone that uh, um, had pretty foul language, uh, but through the influence of another Christian person that, that didn't use foul language, over time, that man used less and less profanity, uh, especially when he was with that person that he respected. Uh, so we can influence, we can be the uh, seed for good uh, in, in those situations. It's easier, you know, when, when we're together, but we still have that strength to go out and influence others. If we're gonna make a difference, we need to commit ourselves to a great purpose. Somebody wrote, great people are ordinary people who commit to a great cause. You know, I was trying, trying to think of politicians, and if you think back to the Second World War, it was a very difficult time. And during difficult times, people can rise, you know, to the front and be great leaders. Winston Churchill, you know, was a leader in Great Britain. And through his speeches, you know, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. You know, he challenged the people. He might not have been known as a great leader if he had not lived during the time <clears throat> when he was able to rally the nation so that they could overcome. And Eisenhower, you know, the, the commander of the Allied forces in Europe, probably you never would have heard of his name if it wasn't for the opportunity that he had to lead the Allied forces during the Second World War. So during times of great stress, men and women can rise to great power. And that's, I think, the situation that we find ourselves in right now. This is a bad time for America. And we need somebody on a national scene, I would love to see it, someone that could stand and challenge, you know, the status quo of the political situation and rally people together because I think we all want the same thing, but the political parties are more concerned about other things about themselves and they are solving the problems that we have. So we have to have that great purpose. Uh, Matthew 20, 26 says, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. So as you think about how to be great, you need to think about what it is to be a servant. If you want to be a great salesman, serve the people you're trying to sell to. If you want to be a great teacher, serve your students. If you want to be a great coach, serve the members of the team. If you want to be a great politician, serve the people that you're leading. Service is the key to what God wants to be able to bring about and to challenge us in these areas. So is your goal success or significance? Are you just trying to reach some goal that doesn't really have uh, that much meaning? Or do you want your life to have significance, something where you will leave the world a better place when you're gone and when, you, and when, when people look back over your life? The Bible says lay up not treasure on earth, but treasure in heaven. On earth it's gonna, you know, it's going to rust, the moths are going to eat it, and it's going to disappear. But we lay up treasure in heaven that is a lasting treasure that we have. And one final thing that I'd like for us to consider today, if we want to be significant, we have to have the courage to stand alone. We all want to be liked. We all want people to agree with us, but the world is not going to agree. When Jesus came, he attracted a lot of people, but there were many people that hated him. Robert Frost wrote the poem about, came to a road diverged in the woods, and he said, I took the road less traveled, and that has made all the difference in the world. Matthew chapter seven, Jesus says, enter, through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow is the way that leads to life, and only a few find it. Yeah, you know, I always think 
You look at what God has for us. You look at, if we would follow his commands, what would the world be like? And I think, why wouldn't everyone want to be a Christian? Why wouldn't we all want to be humble? Why wouldn't we all want to be caring? Why wouldn't we reach out and help the person that's downtrodden and, you know, that's, that's neglected? Why wouldn't everybody want to do that? And I, I can't find an answer. But I know there's a wide road it's leading to destruction, and that's where the people are beating a path to. But God calls us to make choices. And maybe the reason that the Christian life is a little harder is because it requires responsibility. You have to do something. And maybe we're just lazy, and maybe we're selfish. And maybe that's why, you know, everyone doesn't accept Christ. Why wouldn't everyone want to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior? In 1 Corinthians 16, it says, Be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous. Be strong. Do everything in love. We need to be courageous. We need to be strong. Because if we go along with the crowd, nothing's ever going to get done. You know, Galileo and Copernicus were ridiculed because, you know, they challenged the scientific theories of the day. You know, that the earth was not the center of the universe. And, you know, they were even excommunicated by the church because, you know, church has done pretty stupid things over the years. Even Albert Einstein, you know, with his theories of relativity and other things in the beginning, you know, people are still saying, well, he was wrong. You know? Well, they have all the, you know, what, 50 years of history, scientific knowledge, but he got almost everything right, but he was able to challenge, you know, the conventional wisdom of that time. Social leaders like Abraham Lincoln, Wil William Wil Wilberforce, who almost single-handedly turned the nation of England against slavery, it took him 26 years. He was alone for a long time but he persevered and was able to accomplish something that needed to be done. We have to be willing to stand alone against the culture. What do you fear more? The disapproval of men, what they're gonna think of you, or do you fear the disapproval of God? Uh, the disapproval of men isn't going to make a whole lot of difference. <laughs> but if you stand before God and he disapproves of how you've lived, it's going to be a serious issue. You've probably heard this quote goes way back. Uh, uh, I think it might have been Kennedy that used it. The only thing necessary for evil to triumph is for good people to do nothing. Evil will be there. There is good in this world, and there is evil in this world. Evil will triumph if good people do nothing. But if good people lift up the truth, lift up Jesus Christ, then I think people will see the truth and will be drawn to him more than ever. We need people that aren't just trying to succeed in the meaning list things of life, but people that are trying to succeed in areas of life of significance, that we can be drawn back to God, that we can stand, and that we can make a difference. Where does it begin? Begins in the home. Begins in those times as, um, was it Mike or Ray that talked about holding their child for the first time? and taking serious that responsibility that this child is God's gift to you. And we need to train them up and help them in such a way that they know and understand the Lord and that they can then pass it on. We share the hope of God with our children and we also need to reach out to the children in our community and surrounding areas that don't have a father, that don't have a faith, so that God can be honored. Father's Day is a, a great time of celebration, a time of encouragement, 
in a time of challenge. May we be God's people and follow his way because we have a loving Heavenly Father. Father, we thank you that you've created us, that you've given us this world, that you have given us your word. And even when we had sinned and gone astray, you sent your son that we could be brought back to you, returned to the family, welcomed as the prodigal son who was away but had come home and the father welcomed him. We know of your love and I pray that you would help us to love within our families and to reach out of our families to those that need your help and your love. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen.